Chapter 7. That night our warriors were called. The old men and women packed their few things. At midnight we left our camp and started south for Whitebird Canyon, the home of Whitebird's band. At dawn on the fifth day we came to the crest of a canyon of brush and rock. This was Whitebird Canyon, a place where we could stay while we decided whether to fight or flee. We knew the land and our chiefs thought it was the safest place to camp. If the whites follow, said Two Hole Zoot, we hide and shoot them down as fast as they come. Streams ran through the big canyon. Water trickled against stone walls. Beyond us on the cliff, we posted a warrior to watch for the soldiers. All that day and all that night we waited. My father did not sleep. At the first gray light, a scout rode into our camp. Soldiers coming close, he called. Many soldiers. My father rose swiftly. He spoke with the other chiefs. We must not shoot first, he said. Maybe they come with good hearts. Olicott agreed. The chief sent out a truce party. Five warriors rode to meet the soldiers. One of them carried a white flag to say that we did not wish war. The other young men waited on their horses, hidden behind the buttes. From our camp, we heard a bugle. Then a rifle spoke. The lone shot echoed against the stone walls. There was a long silence, then the sound of guns. A warrior rode into a streak of daylight on the crest of the canyon. He waved his bow above his head. War, he shouted. The soldiers fired on our white flag. Here we stand, Olicott shouted. We go no farther. First we die, then we die again. Olicott, with his good plans and bravery in battle, was our most cunning chieftain. Chief Joseph disagreed. We should hide until night and then slip away. There are too many soldiers. They will kill half our family. My father always thought of his plan first. There were not many of us. Olicott divided the warriors and sent them along the hillside. I watched them go, dodging behind the huge stones. I watched Swan Necklace. He rode with the other redcoats, no longer afraid to fight. My heart beat proudly. I wanted to ride with him. Instead, I took a group of children into a sheltered place beside the creek where we could play games and forget the bullets flying on the other side of the butte. We held contests to see which one could hold their breath longest. I smoothed off a flat rock and some of the boys spun tops, making them dance across its surface. Red Owl, Olicott's son, started a game of wolf. He pretended to be a wolf and the other children pretended to be the calves who had strayed from their mothers. He crept behind the bushes along one side of our sheltered place. The other children pretended to be grazing while they waited for his attack. But Red Owl did not burst out of the bushes to frighten the others. Time passed. I moved quietly to the bushes and looked over them. There was no one to be seen. Red Owl was gone. I put one of the older girls in charge of the little ones and began to look for him. I knew he had left to watch the battle. Red Owl had seen only seven snows, but he itched to be with the warriors. I climbed the butte, lying on my stomach. I looked across the battlefield. Horses were running in every direction. I saw one horse, its saddle stained with blood, dragging a blue coat whose foot was caught in the stirrup. Crossing a low ridge in the distance was Red Owl. Five horse lengths in front of him lay a dead blue coat. Beside his outstretched hand was a shining bugle. I called Red Owl, but he did not stop. He wanted the bugle for his own. As he reached it, our warriors mounted a charge. They rode past the bugler, and Red Owl was lost from view. Heedless of gunfire, I flew down the butte. When I reached Red Owl, I dropped to the ground beside him. He had taken cover behind the bugler's body. He was afraid to move. So many bullets struck around us that my eyes smarted from the dust. As our warriors' bullets and arrows found their mark, the battle moved away. The shouts and gunfire grew faint. Red Owl raised his head and grinned at me. The bugle was clutched tightly in his fist. I got to my feet and grabbed his arm. My heart still beat fast. Foolish child, I said, as my fear turned to anger. You will be the death of us. His face grew solemn, and he was quiet as we walked back to the camp. He would not be so boastful in front of the others. It was bad enough that the children would admire Red Owl's daring. I did not want them to copy his pranks. At last, the battle ended. 
We were badly outnumbered, but Alakot drove our warriors. He made them believe that they were truly fighting for their lands and lives and gods. None of our people was killed, and only two warriors were wounded. By nightfall, we had forced every blue coat to flee, and 34 white soldiers lay dead upon the ground. There would be more battles with the blue coats, Chief Joseph promised. They will follow us. We cannot hide. They will find us wherever we go. Looking Glass said that we must cross the mountains and travel to the land of the crows. Howard could not bring his big guns over the mountains. We could live in peace with the crows and hunt buffalo. The other chiefs agreed. My father was not happy. This is your fight, not mine, he said. I will look after the women and children and old men. You must keep the soldiers away. We left Whitebird Canyon and the beaten soldiers. I felt like singing. My pony stepped lively through the grass. Flowers were blooming under the oaks and huckleberries. I rode in the gray dust with the children behind all the old people. I made a doll for my baby sister with a piece of soldier's shirt. The youngest Joseph, nephew of old Joseph, had found a soldier's knife and was chasing Red Owl. My small cousin had a pair of soldier's heavy boots and asked me to cut off their tops and make a purse out of them. Beside me rode White Feather, who had watched me shoot the copper pan from the white woman's hands. She was a year older than I. Are you pleased? she asked. The warriors have won and your father has lost. I am pleased, I said. We have beaten the blue coats. If they follow us, we will beat them again. There was a whoop from the children. Young Joseph had caught Red Owl and was sticking him in the chest. I took the knife away from him, and when I came back, Swan Necklace was riding with White Feather. My pony fell in beside them. Were you frightened? I asked Swan Necklace. Just at first, he said. Then I knew my guardian spirit would keep me safe. While Litsits and Red Moccasin Tops rode beside me, we charged the soldiers. Two moons and the other warriors followed. Many of them had only knives or bows. His eyes sparkled as he told of the battle. The bullets sang like bees around us, but no one was hit, he said. We clung to the side of our horses where the blue coats could not see us and shot from beneath the neck. Our guns and arrows found their mark. The soldiers stopped shooting. Their horses went wild and tossed them on the ground. They dropped their guns and ran for their lives. I clapped my hands with joy. I have plenty of bullets now, said Swan Necklace, and all the warriors have rifles. The soldiers won't need them anymore.